Yes, yeah, so I highly encourage, oh nice, this is working. I highly encourage all of you to, to sign up and do that weekend internship. It's gonna be an awesome time of study. Um, it's kind of nice that I got a new microphone today. Yeah, we're upgrading. We got new microphone. I feel like uh, when, they get, when you got a new microphone, you know, I feel like when you go to the grocery store now and you have to uh, check yourself out, and it's like, I have not been trained on this equipment. <laughs> and, you know, we're just thrown into it. And that's how I feel when I get a new microphone. I have not been trained on this new equipment. Today, okay, so uh, I wanted to, you guys know like uh, sermon titles nowadays, and churches as well, sermon titles and churches, they're, they're getting so short, you know? Like in a word, they're, they're getting shorter and shorter. Like I feel like every new church that's popping up is the verb or the geography, you know, it's like the river or the destiny or, um, you know, the, you know, the revival. It's like every Christian word or, you know, so I wanted to do something extravagant for today's sermon title. And so today's sermon title is the starting revela- the startling revelation of what it means to be a, ma- a lamb among wolves. Did you guys get that? The startling revelation of what it means to be a lamb among wolves. Yeah, I wanted to go P.T. Barnum on this sermon. (laughs) Really go over the top with it. We are in this sermon series of All Eyes on Jesus, or AOJ, as I talked about a couple weeks ago. And today we are going to look at how Jesus sends us. You see, Jesus gives us a strategy for evangelizing. And uh, evangelizing is a funny word, and it's potentially offensive, especially to those who do not want to be evangelized to. And a lot of things are potentially offensive nowadays, but just because, just because it might be doesn't mean that we ought to not do it. And just because this passage is about evangelizing does not mean that we ought to not listen if we're not gifted in evangelizing. All right, I said that, and uh, there was not a big amen here in the room, but um, I thought that there might be. Yeah, thank you, Pastor Ty, for being the one person to say, well done. All right, so here's the outline. (laughs) Here's what we're going to do today. All right, I'm going to pray. We're going to get there. I'm going to pray. I'm going to read a couple verses. I'm going to stop as we go and talk about it and and we'll be done. It's really easy. All right? So first step, pray. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, all eyes are on you, Lord, and uh, you are so good at handling the pressure when the world looks at you. Lord, uh, I, I hope that we learn something today, that we're, we're engaged in this it's not an invitation, it's a command. You say go. Lord, and I hope that we're engaged in that command, that we are obedient to it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Today's passage is on Luke 10. Today's, uh, you know, it's, it's only four verses, so, you know, I, I'd appreciate it if you open it up, to, open up to it, but if you, if you know, if you're like, I'm just going to listen, great. Just sit back. Enjoy it. Okay, here we go. Verse, uh, Luke 10, verse 1. After this, okay, first stop. <laughs> after this, after what, Luke? You see, Luke is very concerned with being correct, okay? Like if there's, like um, all the four different gospel writers, they, they have a different, um, I would say, point of view that they're trying to get across, different perspective that they're bringing. Luke, he's very concerned with being correct. John, he's not as concerned about that. He, he's like, God is Lord, God, you know, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. That's what John is all about. But Luke, he's way concerned with getting this correct, 
I remember when I was studying um, you know, the New Testament, I was going through it, and I, and I kept reading that Luke is a gentle physician. And I was like, how do they know what, like, what type of physician he was? No, but he's a Gentile physician, so that was <laughs> felt pretty stupid, just missing that eye. So he, I was like, how do they know that he's so nice about it? But no, so he's, he's a Gentile physician. He's you know, and like most doctors, they're very concerned with being correct. And so when Luke puts in here, after this, he is referencing something like in chronological order, that there was something before this. And if you are opened up to your Bible, maybe it's a couple words before. If you're opened up your Bible, it's one flick away. In, verse, in chapter 9, verse 62... You see, actually, in my Bible, I've got the, like, the, the bold headings. Do you guys have those? The bold headings that kind of tells you, like, what's, what's going to be um, happening in, like, the next couple verses. And so, for mine, the bold heading is the cost of following Jesus. So, okay. Some translations talk about that there's a warning. The warning of following Jesus. All right. But, I mean, that's not in the Bible. But, like, let's read what this warning or this cost is. In verse, uh, in verse 62, or let's start in 61, 961, still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. Woo! No one who puts their hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service of the king, in the kingdom of God. So when, in in Luke 10, when we get the strategy for evangelizing, we ought to know that this is after Jesus gives this warning. You see, Luke is concerned with that. He wants us to remember that if we really want to pick up this strategy, we re- need to remember that this is after Jesus gave us the warning, don't look back. Put your hand to the plow. Get to work. And when I read, when I, you know, I was doing a little bit of study, uh, uh, a little bit, you know, a little bit of study, not too much, okay? Don't worry, it wasn't too much work. No, no, uh, a little bit of study on this, and, and there's a lot of people who are uh, concerned with trying to explain Jesus here. They, they try to explain Jesus. They say, oh, well, you know, what he really meant, or what he really meant to say here, I think... That's a really dangerous place to be. I think, really, that Jesus meant what he said. That Jesus really meant that no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. Do not be concerned with the world. Get to work. That's what Jesus is saying. Don't be concerned with uh, going back, making sure you've got everything in order, that everything's ready to go, you got your bags packed. I had a really weird dream, okay? I thought about not telling this, but I'm going to. Okay, so it was me and the elders, and we were on a mission trip. We were on a mission trip, okay? We were on a mission trip, and we were in South America, just all of it. So we were in South America, and... Um, and uh, I was getting in trouble. I was launching fireworks, and, uh, and Lumumba, he had to bring me to detention, and um, Pablo and I were texting, and he was correcting all my typos, and I was like, I'm busy. I'm getting sent to detention, and, and Josh just grabbed me and threw me on a bus, and he's like, go to Liverpool, England, and I was like, can I go and get my bags? And he was like, no. And I feel like that was in preparation here for this. It was like, don't look back. Just go to Liverpool on bus 110. What a weird dream. Okay, dreams are funny. Um, so, Josh, you are like Christ in my dream, although I was mad at you. I was mad at you for not letting me get my bag that I... Yeah, had my wallet in order to get to... Okay, so, the, all right, we're moving on. All right, so after this, the Lord appointed 72 other... All right, so we're back in chapter 10. 
Uh, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them out two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He sent them two by two. There's a reason for this. There's a reason that he sent them two by two. The first strategy of evangelism is to not be alone. All right? Come on. Don't be alone. There is a huge pushback right now of, um, you know, there's a huge pushback. How do I want to put this? There's a huge pushback of uh, the church is not necessary, right? I mean, I, I could be religious. I could believe in God. I could follow Jesus, but I don't need to go to church. And it's like, actually, like, Christ is quite concerned with community. Christ is quite concerned with you not being alone. You know, your relationship with him needs to be personal, but it, it's not merely personal. There is um, a community here, and, and, and we need to remember that Christ, when he sends us, he sends us two by two. Okay, so as we get into this, I guess I should, you know, um, I feel led to, to, to talk about like, what Jesus is talking about here. You see, Jesus is not talking about sending us to each other, okay? He's not, he's not talking here about sending us to each other. You know, Christians ought to be aware and concerned with di- discipling one another, but this, this sermon, he's talking about evangelizing. He's talking about talking to people, bringing the good word of himself to people who don't know him. He's talking about, uh, he's talking about that you need to go and be sent two by two to people who don't know me. And the reason that they don't know me is because Jesus hasn't gone there yet. But then, note, here it says where he was about to go. You see, we need to almost pave the way, all right? Does that make sense? We need to pave the way. We think, ah, yes, if, all right, so there's a non-Christian in my life. That's what I'm, okay? There's a non-Christian in my life. It's a weird way to label someone. It's definitely a way. It's a non-Christian in my life. I'm very concerned with them. And Holy Spirit, if you change their life around, then I'll step in, right? If you make them ready to hear about you, oh, then I'll be there. No, 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 no. Notice this. You see, Luke is concerned with being right. Jesus sends them to where he was about to go. Okay? Isn't that cool? So in some ways, Jesus says, hey, those non-Christians in your life? Go talk to them. They are not ready. They don't know me yet. Go pave the way. All right? Pave the way. You lead it. And then God follows. It's interesting because we think about us following Jesus. And we're following Jesus' command here. But in a way, he follows behind us. You know? In baseball, they call that the cleanup. You know? Like in baseball, when I grew up... so. It's kind of interesting. Baseball now, everyone can hit home runs, and it's, like, brilliant that, like, it took this long for everyone to figure out that that's how you should play baseball. Just everyone on the team can hit home runs. But growing up, there was players who could not hit home runs, but they were fast. And so they would just get on base so that the people who could hit home runs could hit them all in, and that was called batting cleanup. So um, now, you know, just be that fast guy. Get in there. And let them hit you home. In verse, in verse 2, oh man, we're only on verse 1. Whew, what am I, Pablo? <laughs> he told them the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. It's easy to focus It's easy to focus on the harvest is plentiful. It is easy to focus on that part, and it is easy to focus on how few the workers are, and that is an important detail. It is. It is an important detail, and I think it's probably been hit home in all of our lives sometimes, but in light of the warning 
that Jesus gave us about putting our hand to the plow and needing to get to work. I guess one thing I'd like to say here is a question. Have you ever felt like the church wasn't doing enough? Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like, like the church was not doing enough? Great. Me too. Jesus as well. The harvest is plenty and the workers are few. It is hard to do enough. However, it is dangerous. It is dangerous to criticize the church's shortcomings. That's point, that full stop. It is dangerous to criticize the church's shortcomings if we become grumblers of the bride of Christ. I dare you to try to grumble to me about my wife. And I have no authority, right, to harm you. But, ooh, Jesus says uh, those without sin can cast the first stone, and everyone leaves, and we all remember that. But uh, Jesus does not give up his own right to cast that stone. Just a reminder, right? He's the one without sin. Woo. It is dangerous to criticize the church's shortcomings of not doing enough. It is especially dangerous to criticize the shortcomings of the church and to expect someone else to put their hands to the plow. That's especially dangerous. Repent from doing that. Josh, uh, a couple weeks ago, he gave an excellent preach on Isaiah 6, and it's available online. It's titled is, uh, My Eyes Have Seen the King. Go back and watch it. But he reminds us, he reminds us that when we see the king, our natural way to work that out is to say, here I am, Lord, send me. Not, here I am, Lord, send someone else. That's not it. That is not it. Oh, man, when we, too often when we come to the word of God, we're like, oh, man, this would be so good for someone else. Oh, like, my cousin for sure needs to hear this one. And it's like, whoa. Woo-hoo-hoo. The workers are few. What are you doing? Look at this next step here. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore. This is prayer. Ask the Lord of the harvest. The strategy for evangelism, get this, praying hey, maybe you aren't an evangelist, but you can pray. Prayer is such an important aspect of the behavior of Christian. Uh, We need to get over our uncomfortability with praying. We need to just get over that right now. We need to, it's time to mature. We need to pray. We need to pray out loud. We need to pray with one another. Because how are you going to ask the Lord of the harvest? if you aren't going to ask the Lord of the harvest. Does that make sense? I know that that's silly. But how are you going to ask the Lord of the harvest to send workers if you aren't going to ask the Lord of the harvest to send workers? We need to be concerned with this. We need to find workers. We need to be a worker. And we need to find workers. Souls are at stake, church. Don't forget it. Souls are at stake. There seems to be less interest in the eternity of our souls, especially amongst people who are atheist and materialist. We cannot be like them and not concern ourselves with souls. Verse 3 says, go. Jesus loves his command. (sighs) Go. He uses it with the adulterous woman in the Great Commission and and here as well. Church, go. Here we go into the verse that I really wanted to talk about. I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. The title of the sermon is The Startling Revelation of What It Means to Be a Lamb Among Wolves. And while 
preparing this sermon, I had the weirdest idea, and it came to me from Josh, although he didn't do it on purpose. Um, but I want you guys to preach to yourselves. Okay? Close your eyes. Everyone close your eyes. And preach to yourselves for a second. What is the startling revelation of what it means to be a lamb among wolves? Mmm, that's good. What is the startling revelation? Preach to yourself. I don't have to do it for you. The Holy Spirit right now is ministering to you. You can open up your eyes. I don't have to do it for you, but I'm going to. You see, um, I remember Alan, <clears throat> Alan Scotland, he uh, talked about this briefly. And if you've been going here for a while, you know his name, but maybe you don't, but he's a dear friend of this church. He's a very, very godly and righteous man. And he is our apostle. And he means so much to this church. And he travels into many nations, across many churches. He oversees churches in some of the most desolate places. And he is friends. And he works alongside people around the world, people who view persecution as not just uh, masks, but truly life and death persecution. And I recall him preaching, I recall him preaching about, I recall him preaching about this verse, and his direct quote is, why does God send us out as a lamb among wolves? I don't know. Now that you've preached yourself, Alan has preached to you a little bit, it's my turn. No. I, I think it is worth noting, I think it is worth noting that we ought not to try to explain away everything that Jesus does and everything that Jesus says. He sends you as a lamb among wolves. And it's not that the wolves are each other. The wolves are the people outside of these walls, the people who don't know Christ. They are wolves. He sends them out. And, it's, uh, and wolves can be scary. Not the Timberwolves, the basketball team. They're awful. Uh, no one is scared by them, but wolves, the animal, they are pretty scary. And, and, and the reason that they're scary is because wolves howl, wolves gnash their teeth, they show how tough they are, they travel in packs. Wolves are exactly what they are. We know all about wolves. So what does it mean here to be sent as lambs among wolves? You know, lambs are cute. Lambs are fluffy. But they will not beat up a wolf. You see, we are sent as lambs to the wolves because it has nothing to do with us being cute or fluffy, although we are. I, you guys are very cute. It has nothing to do with us being cute or fluffy. It has to do with that we have a good shepherd. You see, we are sent as, we are sent as lambs among wolves because we have a shepherd. And you have to understand, if a wolf attacks a lamb, the shepherd intervenes. Someday, the shepherd will intervene. Jesus not only is that good shepherd that leads us, but he was also a perfect example of what it means to be a lamb. We, we, we often sing uh, the blood of the lamb, about the blood of the lamb. We, we worship him, we thank him for that, that uh, that he is like the lamb, that we are passed over. 
man, there's so much there. I'm going to just move on, though. I uh, preach yourself on that. You guys got that? You see, Jesus is not the perfect example of being a lamb because he's cute and fluffy. Right? You know that. But because he follows the good shepherd, even to the point of death. You see, I, I think... I think that Jesus did not want to die on the cross. I mean, I, I'm, oh, I'm very certain. He prayed to God. He said, don't let me die on the cross. <laughs> Anything but that. But you see, his father told him to do it. And he was obedient. And a natural thing that happens when we follow the good shepherd is that we love the world. A true loving of the world. You see, Jesus didn't say, ah, I want to love the world. He said, I want to be obedient to God. And then from that came loving the world. Does that make sense? You guys following me on this? I'm going to say it again, all right? Jesus didn't come out and say, I want to love the world. He said, I'm going to be obedient to God, and this is what it meant, that he would lay down his life. And then a natural outcome of that was that he loved the world in this way. Worship team, come on up. We are sent. We need to be uh, way more concerned way more, I just point blank, we need to be way more concerned with the wolves in our lives. We need to be way more concerned with the souls of our enemies. And to be sent by God means that you might need to lay down your life. because we listen to the shepherd. Dear Jesus, as we uh, prepare our hearts for worship, Lord, speak to us, as you already have been doing. May we worship you and praise you. Lord, thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, I would like to encourage you guys to email me, uh, whatever. Um, you can email me or message me on uh, social media, whatever. Um, what the Holy Spirit and you were preaching at yourself during that moment. Okay, please? I would love to hear from you guys. So, thank you. Let's worship. Mm -hmm.